Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this um, fourth day of the Zoom panels um, at the African Feminisms Conference. Um, this afternoon, um, I will be um, introducing, we'll be having three panels as we have in previous days, as well as an artistic presentation um, at around four o'clock. I am going to first present the first panel, um, which is on solidarity and the politics of care. Um, it will be chaired by um, Chido um, Nyaruwata, who is one of the young feminist leaders um, from the African Gender Institute. Chido, um, over to you. Thank you so much for introducing me, Polo. Welcome to the eighth session of the ASEM conference. As Polo said, today we will be having um, a conversation around solidarity and the politics of care. We will have three presentations from our speakers. And our speakers are given 15 minutes to present on their papers. And then afterwards, we will have discussions I encourage everyone to share their comments or questions in the chat box. And then we can, with these questions, this will guide our discussion after the presentation. So we will start off with uh, Salima Vilani with the politics of poorly behaved nurses and socialist feminist healing for South African health system. Then we will go on to our second presentation with Daniela Arison and No Keto Mashlanga, creating a space for feminist healing and solidarity, fostering mentorship. And lastly, we will end with Lindsay Kalen with feminist solidarity and theory in South Africa. As I stated, our speakers have 15 minutes to present, so I kindly ask that you stay within the time frame. So let us start off with our first presentation um, by Selima. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chido, and to the organizers. I am worried about time, so let me jump in. Share screen is not working. May I share my screen, please? Great. So as we just heard, the politics of poorly behaved nurses and socialist feminist healing for South Africa's health system is what I will be discussing. I'm using material from these three articles and one research monograph authored by me. Let's jump into it. I want to first talk about the big picture of health. And this is the Indigo Wellness Index ranking for South Africa. South Africa got the lowest score in, in the world. Uh, Canada, which happens to be where I'm from, got the highest. You can see around this beautiful purple shape, the different indicators that were used to make the ratings. Much of this will not be surprising to people living in South Africa. Uh, my article, one of them that I'm talking about, looks at healthcare and nurses over the 25 years of democracy in South Africa. So what I've done here is I've mapped the nurse to population ratio for as many of the 25 years as I could do. Now, what you see is 
very little increase in the nurses per 10,000 people in the country. So it hovers around 45, a little bit below in 1998, a little bit higher by 2018. But given a population with this type of health status, one would think that in democracy, we would have more nurses, given that, of course, nurses of the various types that we have in South Africa make up 81% of the public health professional posts. So this is the main labor force dealing with people in need of medical care. How does this nurse to population ratio compare with other middle income countries? Okay, so when our leaders say, oh, but we're not a rich country. Well, compared to middle income countries around the world, South Africa does not fare very well uh, with roughly 51 nurses per 10,000 population and uh, not a very high life expectancy at birth. Now let's look at government health expenditure as a percentage of general government expenditure over this same period roughly. What you see in the green line up above is the level of spending that African leaders pledged to do in 2001, way back in the last major pandemic that hit the continent at 15%. Sorry, my apologies, my apologies Salima. Um, your screen share seems to be stuck. So we are stuck on the first screen. Could you switch it off and, and, and try okay. to repair again? Yeah. Yes, um, okay. but, yeah. Thank you for telling me. Uh, share. Now, do you see government health expenditure? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think that you missed the last two. Sorry. This is the nurse to population ratio. You see the years there. It hasn't changed a lot is the main point. Hovering around 50 per 50 nurses per 10,000 people in the country. How does that compare with other middle income countries? Not so well, as you can see there. Still with me? Yes. Now we have, okay, thank you. Now we have the government health expenditure as a percentage of general government expenditure. African leaders pledged in 2001 to spend 15% of total government social spending on health in here in South Africa, we never reached past about 10% and lower in several years. This is the austerity that critical people talk about, but which I must point out that in the health systems literature is, 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 violently uh, objected to. So it is not a fact in the health systems discussions that we have had austerity and the nature of it. Okay, so just uh, let me move now to PowerPoint. So my argument is that rather than solving these big picture systemic problems, we find fault in women. And that is, of course, nurses, the main face of the health system. This, I argue, is rooted in misogyny. I must say, it's very nice to be in this safe space to talk so openly.
let's look at nurses' working experiences. So when I say that we blame nurses, I think you all can imagine the stories, the media headlines, even many of the academic studies that demonize nurses. Let's look at nurses' working experiences over time. This is a study of almost 2,000 nurses, nine different provinces of the country. Uh, the survey was done in about 2005. Major conclusion, stressors related to staff issues were clearly the most severe for all categories of nurses. What are staff issues? Insufficient staff to handle the workload, shortage of staff, poorly motivated coworkers, fellow workers not doing their jobs. Other top stressors that nurses talked about, watching patients suffer. That's that very high level of morbidity or illness in the population. Patient demands, the great needs of patients, health risks posed by contact with patients. Of course, we saw this loud and clear during COVID and we continue to, lack of recognition. Here's something from the Department of Health 2011. They calculated, though they didn't publish this in the final report, a public sector nurse shortage of some 45,000 nurses back in 2011. Also stated in this uh, draft report, high numbers of vacancies in the public sector. Vacancies means posts that the state does not fill. Also in the report, without naming budgetary constraints, they say it would be impossible to fund the unfilled post. This again is due to misogyny. A study of 69 nurses in five Gauteng and Free State hospitals. Over 90% of the nurses agreed. Uh, with the content of the International Code of Ethics for Nurses, as well as the South African Nurses Pledge, but they identify workplace constraints as the cause for them not being able to uphold the code and pledge. Public sector nurses named disrespect from patients and being blamed by managers for errors and problems stemming from systemic inefficiencies and staff shortages. There it is again. I'm worried about time, so please ask me <laughs> in the discussion if you wanna hear more about this, but this is a direct quote from a nurse manager. And what it shows is that nurse managers are also facing great stress, both on and off the job, Another study of nurse managers, hospital-based. Nurse managers through this time in motion study were found to be performing 36 different tasks per hour, many unplanned, fragmented, and of short duration. And you can see the percentages of time broken down there for the different types of work in these 36 different tasks per hour. This is the atrophy of misogyny, violence in the workplace endured by the lowest rank of nurses, of course, student nurses. And what you see here is different types of violent behavior and close to half being treated differently, close to 20% being shouted at in a rage at work. The most typical perpetrators of workplace violence. There you have it. We see the hierarchy of nurses. And so when I say the atrophy of misogyny, 
This is people hate nurses, nurses hate themselves, nurses hate each other. We know this is typical in misogyny, culture of misogyny. Let's get to some feminist solutions, <laughs> some good news. Sorry, Selima, unfortunately we have two more minutes. So two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. And we're still not able to see the slides. So I'm not sure if you can fix that just so that we can move through. You can't the see PDF. the slides? Yeah, it's still on the PDF. Uh, okay, I'm trying the same thing again to share. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see feminist solutions. The first major area, take care of the health of the majority. We often don't talk about health when we talk about health care. So public investment in collective food production. This is basic to improving the health of the majority so that they don't need health care. Public investment in collective housing construction. This would not be through tenders. Public investment in collectively defined, culturally appropriate healing. This is for all of the historical, political hurt and psychic hurt, which are one in the same, as Nadia David said yesterday at this conference. Weekly health literacy and support groups as part of public health care. The other big area of change with regard to health workers, what we need is job laddering and supported training for community health workers and all levels of nurses. We need to recognize and increase the leadership of nurses, given that high per percentage of nurses in the professional workforce. We need to broaden the scope of care create new rungs in that ladder. Basically, this means nurses replacing doctors who are already in shortage in the public sector and who are not so interested in providing care in the public system. A living wage for all community health workers. Decommodify healthcare, this is a big one. It means public production of all inputs needed for healthcare. We saw the shortcoming of this through COVID, whether it was the masks needed by healthcare workers, whether it was the machines needed to breathe, all of this globally was in shortage and this has to do with the monopoly in medical technology. That monopoly is not dealt with in the national health insurance. This is from government's own study published in May 2017. These companies that you see here are the great controllers of health care production in this country. You can see they are controlling every single aspect of care from hospitals to the insurance, to pharmacies, to the medical products. If we don't break this monopoly, we will have a healthcare system that overruns in costs because a monopoly means excess, oh, well, it means, it means goods controlled by companies to their advantage, which means eating up public money increasingly already occurred. Sorry to cut you off, Nina, but we have to go on to our next speaker. But um, as you stated, our guests can pop questions about your presentation and we can have more conversation at the end. Um, I now invite Daniela and Vivian to present. Thank you so much.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nuket Sumshanga, and I'll be presenting with Daniel. And our presentation is titled Mentorship, Reflecting on Feminist Mentoring as a Space for Healing. The presentation will cover the following. So I'll take you through the introduction, the landscape of mentorship, reimagining mentorship, our, the methods we used, and I will give my reflections as a mentee. And Daniel will take you through her reflections as a mentor and our concluding thoughts. To introduce the topic, in many parts of the globe, the last decades have, decades have seen Black females take advantage of the reduced education and career barriers. In South Africa, due to its roots, in racial inequality and patriarchy, Black females entering the work environment or professionals are still faced with hostile working conditions. Racial and gender inequality permeates all spheres of the workplace, such as the formalized structures of institutions, their recruitment, their remuneration, and their working hours. It further permeates informal structures of everyday interactions all of which accumulatively reinforce women's inferiority. The unique set of challenges and heightened levels of vulnerability faced by Black female professionals have implications for learning opportunities and ultimately career growth. So mentorship has been identified as an essential tool to aid this group to successfully navigate their careers. The mentoring behind the meaning behind the term mentoring varies here, varies, and here we refer to mentorship as junior inexperienced people being taken under the wing of older and more experienced persons who will teach and guide them. Before we go into sistering mentorship, I will give you a brief outline of the current landscape of mentoring. Um, so the engagement with the mentor facilitates learning, which plays a vital role in shaping the mentee through teaching and nurturing. It ultimately changes the behavior and elicits personal development. Although the goals of the mentoring relationship may differ in structure and settings, nearly all mentorships involve knowledge acquisition. The danger of such a relationship is that the authority may be exaggerated as opposed to the mentee feeling empowered, he or she feels frustrated and belittled. Therefore, conventional mentorship seldom considers identity issues and their implications. So the uncritical acceptance of conventional mentorship, which thrives on power dynamics while paying little attention to varied identity specific needs of mentees is problematic and recognizing the significant role that can be played by the mentorship of this group to foster feminism and provide a space for healing for black um, female professionals. We propose a unique mentoring style to help facilitate the aforementioned. And we do this through um, what we call sistering mentorship. Now, Sistering mentorship is the proposed mentorship style. Uh, it's a term that emulates core concepts of the mentor and mentee relationship as experienced by the authors of the paper. So Sistering mentorship adopts a concept coined by Gola as older sistering. So Gola proposes a deviation from the conventional mentor-mentee relationship to a space in which both parties are able to maneuver challenges and focus on the development of the younger sibling without either party being neglected or neglecting their personal development. She proposes all the sistering on the premise that conventional mentoring is concerned with um, young black professionals is to be shown the role, who is to be shown the roles, but but does not offer anything to the mentor, thus making it a one directional and assuming the development of the full development of the mentor. Um, similarly, 
we believe that effective mentorship should be that which resembles African or sisterhood relational praxis, which operates from mutual respect. This sisterhood is best resembled by um, a South African proverb of umuntu umuntu ngabantu, which is loosely defined as each individual ought to serve his or, fellow, his or her fellow man. It offers the following advantages. Effective role modeling of ideal characteristics such as confidence and strength, forming a learning partnership, mentoring as a reciprocal process, presence and the presence of emotional, psychosocial and career related growth and development of both the mentor and the mentee. This type of mentoring is particularly important in the mentorship of black female professionals because it highlights the significance of same-sex solidarity as proposed by black feminism discourse. In essence, the black female mentor who has been exposed to the work environment and devised ways to best inhabit the environment is able to impart direction and support onto the mentee, which also facilitates the development of resilience in the mentee. Now, the methods that we use when writing the paper is autoethnography. The process entailed reflecting on our experience within the role of mentor and mentee in the South African internship context after a year of mentorship. As Black female professionals working within a patriarchal organization, we were cognizant of that our perspectives rely heavily on our subject positions during the internship. Our approach was therefore grounded in a commitment to advocating for mentoring relationships that are attentive to the dismantling of hierarchies of power. And I will now give my reflections of my, main, my experience as the mentee. Um, we first discussed factors of identity. This involved my mentor and I critically engaging with hegemonically distorted images of colored and black races. This facilitated that we consciously begin to unlearn and learn of our rightful identities, which then enhanced our understanding of each other and formed a foundation to build a relationship. We then reflected on the main key subject position. In, many, in my experience, as an intern in a South African organization, the comfort of an intern was based on performing or occupying a particular subject position. It is the failure of occupying the prescribed subject position of intern in this organization which resulted in my traumatization. I describe the experience as traumatic because the events have carved a wound and caused me to adopt a toxic survival mechanism such as the constant surveillance of the self when engaging with members of the organization that occupy a position of power. The intervention of sistering mentorship um, was in that throughout my experiences, my mentor did not concentrate on the negative aspects of which would have reinforced my anger and pain. My mentor instead reaffirmed me and gave me tools which propelled healing as stated by Masango. Sometimes a mentor has to intervene when the mentee is hurt by others. So my mentor ensured that I felt assured, respected and recognized as a competent intern or black professional. The profound gestures of compassion through the sistering mentorship resembled African communal norms, which validates the call for the employment of black feminist principles. The sistering mentorship allowed the elimination of feelings of isolation and professional self-doubt. Sistering mentorship eliminated the power hierarchy of a mentor and a mentee and inspired mutual respect and care. It placed emphasis on developing a bi-directional relationship, which was rooted in mutual respect, love, trust, and shared learning. Furthermore, it allowed the sharing of vulnerabilities challenges and disappointments by creating a space of shared learning, solidarity and trust. In essence, my experience as a mentee 
and black um, female professional has taught me that a sistering mentorship is a holistic practice for the nourishment of both the mentor and the mentee. I will now um, give to Danielle to present her reflections as a mentor. Thank you, Niketo, and afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be continuing with the presentation. So the role of the mentor, myself and the older sister. As a black female professional and mentor, the issue of power is very significant. The yielding of power in unfair and a discriminating manner can easily be done due to the unequal placement of power between the mentor and the mentee. The access of resources between the mentor and mentee is also an issue that affects power and may be used in a manner that inhibits performance. In the adoption of assisting mentorship, I wanted to empower and enrich my mentee in order to face the challenges that await her as a fellow black female professional. My stance in teaching and learning was that I was neither her teacher nor her supervisor, merely her older sister in an organization that may or may not always empower and uplift her due to the inherent hierarchy. As a mentor, the discussion of the intersection of gender, class, and race was crucial to our bonding and in our identifying ourselves as fellow sisters. Although I would be ascribed to be colored by race in terms of apartheid race classifications, I identified as black, specifically with black consciousness in mind. This was an opportunity for learning and unlearning race relations and stereotypes that have been sites of tension in South Africa. It allowed for crucial debates on race construction and the need to deconstruct race to facilitate unity. Moreover, our mentoring sessions were underpinned by black feminist thinking as this allowed for frank conversations and debates around race, identity and class. It facilitated my growth as a mentor as well and allowed me to see how in a space of one year, my mentee had been uplifted, empowered and strengthened. There is power in dismantling and disrupting hierarchical systems that often infringe on growth and learning. The black feminist practice of sistering mentoring involved inclusion of African values of Ubuntu that created the smooth negotiation of the nuances of our identities that were in many ways similar yet divergent. So some of my concluding thoughts are that becoming a professional sometimes entails that one is required to complete an internship in order to complete the professional qualification. The implication of completing an internship was a necessary consideration for us as the authors, as this was the background under which the mentoring took place. An internship at an organization means that you will often not only be, work, often be working within the organization for a specified amount of time. Thus, black female professionals and interns are not always afforded institutional citizenship, which renders them as outsiders and products of objects of production and work. This dehumanizes them and divorces them from the internship site. The organizational citizen or lack thereof does not accommodate difference in opinion, nor does it accommodate defiance. Sistering required that I as the mentor be more conscious of how they relate to the mentee or how I relate to the mentee and construct mentorship as a learning partnership characterized by the impartial of wisdom, knowledge and psychosocial support. So my concluding thoughts on being a black female professional mentoring another black female professional who was an intern is that there is an obligation to challenge the status quo, to limit, to limit suppression and marginalization, prevent victimization, and to counter any superfluous vulnerability. This requires organizations to facilitate avenues for sistering mentorships that facilitate psychosocial support to incoming interns and black female professionals. In a year where gender-based violence and femicide has visibly escalated and become increasingly normalized, sometimes even silenced, the use of black feminism in our mentoring was instrumental. For me as her mentor and sister, I needed to make sure that she was not only heard, seen and acknowledged, but also encouraged despite the observable need of seniors to sometimes exercise their power and enforce seniority over mentees. There are hierarchical systems that exist in organizations at times lead to silencing and invisibility. It is crucial for professionals and internship organizations to reflect on how to provide platforms to silence voices of interns and incoming black female professionals. 
In closing, our sistering mentorship was a reciprocal process that allowed for feminist healing and unity. It is hoped that this engagement will inform alternative mentorship styles and encourage feminist solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much for that powerful presentation on the need for sistering mentorship within our professional spaces. Um, I now invite our final speaker to present. Uh, Lindsay, you have the floor. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, hi. <clears throat> Let me just share my screen with you quickly. Um, all right, can you all see my slides? Yes, you can. All right, so let me begin. I'm also very worried about time. All right, so I haven't written anything on the subject of women as a feminist philosopher in five years. Why, in brief, two formative moments set me down a challenging path. In the first, I became aware of blessed blessy relationships in South Africa and was fascinated by the ways in which women spoke about their agency in these relationships. I wanted to understand whether and if so, how heteronormativity and patriarchy informed the situation and agency of the women. But I was soon discouraged from doing so when a close friend and colleague told me that as a white feminist, I couldn't do this work, at least not on my own. The second moment spans the years of student protest at South Africa's formerly white universities. Beginning in 2015, our students' calls to transform our universities were prolific and reaching my ears for the first time urged me to question and reflect on my role in the South African Academy. Together, these questions led me to reflect on and question my place and role as a white Western feminist philosopher in the South African Academy. What am I able to contribute to the future of the Academy in South Africa, to my students' education and to feminist knowledge production? My race and training in Western philosophy was central to these concerns, and so I found myself engaging with critical decolonial and postcolonial feminist theory in search of answers. It's important to briefly explain why feminists make theory at all. Of course, we make theory to further the knowledge project to improve our understanding of ourselves, one another, and the world. However, while some pursue knowledge for its own sake, the point of making theory for critical scholars lies in, in its ability not only to promote understanding, but thereby to enable effective action. Cornell West, for example, claims that theory is inescapable because it is an indispensable weapon in struggle. It provides certain kinds of understanding that are requisite if we are to act effectively. Similarly, Elizabeth Spellman and Maria Lugones claim that whatever else we know feminism to include, theorizing is integral to it. Theory provides us with the understanding we need to promote effective feminist action. So as a feminist philosopher, I'm interested in producing this kind of theory and aim to further our understanding of the ways in which hegemonic ideologies continue to impact on our lives as South Africans, not simply for the sake of producing knowledge, but in order to further feminist work towards substantial social change on the ground. And so I take these questions seriously. Let me return then to a fuller exposition of some of the central concerns as I've come to understand them over the years. As I do, I will draw extensively on the words of other feminists in response to Audre Lorde's call that where the words of women are crying to be heard, we each of us recognize our responsibility to seek those words out, to read them and share them and examine them in, our, in their pertinence to our lives. So according to Spalman and Lugones, feminist theories focus on the meaning of experiences in the lives of women. But how, is the, how, as they put it, does the theorizer get to the meaning of women's experiences? What does it mean to speak about the experience and conditions of women? Can we speak about women as women, or can we only make contextually specific claims about particular women? Relatedly, can we speak about differently situated women? Decolonial and postcolonial feminists criticize white Western feminists for failing to recognize the complexities posed by these questions when it comes either to the creation of feminist theory or to the ideal of sisterhood. For assuming, for instance, that women are a homogenous group, that all women share a common condition, and that as such, feminists can speak simply as women, for women, and about women without acknowledging differences, positionality, or privilege, or the fact that gender cannot be separately discussed from race, class, and so on. For instance, Chandra Talped Mahanti objects to the cultural imperialism of Western feminism 
which positions women outside of history insofar as we are taken to be an already constituted coherent group with identical interests and desires, regardless of class, ethnic or racial location or contradictions, implying a notion of gender or sexual difference or even patriarchy that can be applied universally and cross-culturally. Instead, Mahanti defends the significance of the heterogeneity of women and a focus on contextually nuanced theorizing about women. Spelman and Lugan is engaging with these concerns directly distinguish between two ways of creating an account of another woman's experience. They say, it is one thing for both me and you to observe you and come up with our different accounts of what you are doing. It is quite another for me to observe myself and others like, much like me culturally and in other ways and to develop an account of myself and then use that account to give an account of you. It is the latter that Western feminists are accused of. Mahanti accuses feminists of practicing a Western feminist, sorry, of practicing discursive colonization, positioning themselves as the implicit referent that is the yardstick by which to encode and represent cultural others. Relatedly, Sylvia Tamale argues that in place of colonial thinking, which binarizes, essentializes, and universalizes, decolonial feminists should adopt an intersectional lens. Decolonizing the African Academy for Tamale involves both unhinging colonization, structural and ideological legacies and conscious resistance to internalized colonial structures of thought. Furthermore, it is because Western feminists tacitly position women as a homogenous group that they believe that solidarity is a given. In contrast, Mahanti argues that sisterhood cannot be assumed. It must be forged in concrete historical and political practices and analyses because beyond sisterhood, there are still racism, colonialism, and imperialism. Ultimately, solidarity isn't rejected, but solidarity based on the idea of the homogeneity of women is. Indeed, while objecting to solidarity on these grounds, Mahanti nevertheless stresses the urgent political necessity of building solidarity across difference. She emphasizes, however, that feminism without borders is not the same as borderless feminism. It acknowledges the fault lines, conflicts, differences, fears, and containment that borders represent. It acknowledges that there is no one sense of a border, that the lines between and through nations, races, classes, sexualities, religions, and disabilities are real, and that a feminism without borders must envision change and social justice work across these lines of demarcation and division. She defends the need for a comparative feminist studies model, suggesting that the challenge is to see how differences allow us to explain the connections and border crossings better and more accurately, how specifying difference allows us to theorize universal concerns more fully. Engaging with these concerns, Spellman concedes that the notion of a generic woman functions in feminist thought much the way the notion of generic man has functioned in Western philosophy. It obscures the heterogeneity of women and cuts off examination of the significance of such heterogeneity for feminist theory and political activity. She goes on to argue that those of us who think that such privilege damages both the women who have it and those who do not must do much more than simply note its presence. For if we really think it can disfigure and distort feminist thought, then we'll want both to understand how such privilege works and to ex and examine how deeply it has informed and deformed feminist thought. I take these concerns seriously. They entail that the feminist theory I am steeped in, have produced and potentially can produce, does, may, and or could reify Western cultural imperialism, amount to discursive colonization, invisibilize the many differences among women and mask the privilege of some like myself. If it does, this would mean that my work supports the status quo I intend to challenge, making it self-defeating. In this light, the questions posed above gain more urgency for me. Notably, is it possible for me to contribute to decolonial feminist theory making in South Africa? And if so, what would this entail? I'm not the first white South African feminist to think about these questions. Um, Deirdre Byrne, for instance, recommends that white anti-racist feminists adopt the ethical stance of ally, center African feminisms and express respect and solidarity in Mahanti's sense. For Byrne, these principles are all marked by holding others in esteem and value while recognizing the inalienable diversity of their context and being. She concludes that white feminists living in Africa and African feminists need to grant each other the starting point of their own positionalities, but also to consider the ways in which they each oppose neoliberal colonialist white supremacist patriarchy and how to work together. 
So is there more that can be said? As seen in her use of intersectionality, supporting the decolonial feminist agenda for Tamale at least does not require jettisoning all theory originating outside of one's place. So following Tamale's lead, I wish to return to the work of feminists in the States who explicitly grappled with these questions in the 80s and 90s. So let's start with Audre Lorde, who's quite positive when it comes to feminists working across difference, although she expresses her own anger and frustrations working across racially with white Western feminists. She claims that our differences have been distorted to further the ends of separation and alienation, that we have been taught to view differences only in opposition to each other, dominant, subordinate, good, bad, superior, inferior, and argues that we must unlearn these lessons if we are to work together. She writes, it is not the differences between us that tear us apart, destroying the commonalities we share. Rather, it is our refusal to examine the distortions which arise from their misnaming and from the illegitimate usage of those differences which can be made when we do not claim them nor define them for ourselves. Sorry, goes on. Yes. Yeah, just one more minute, just confusing remarks so that we have the 10 minutes for um, our discussion. Yeah. Oh, I haven't been going for very long, have I? Oh dear. <clears throat> Okay, um, can I have a couple more minutes? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so Audrey Lord um, goes on, I think this is quite important. She says it's a lifetime pursuit for each one of us to extract these distortions from our living, right? At the same time as we recognize, reclaim and define them. So I'm not going to go through um, Bell Hooks or Maria Lugones, uh, sadly, because they have some really, really, um, really important things to say, I think, about the kinds of attitudes that we need to adopt um, when engaging with other women. But I'm happy to share a draft of the paper. Um, let me just get right to the conclusion. All right, so bringing um, what, I, what I think is interesting from US feminism um, back to the question about cross-racial feminist work in South Africa, I think that we can take away these lessons. So. First, feminism is and must remain a reflexive practice. We cannot shy away re from reflecting on our failures. So I failed to notice the cultural imperialism of the theory I use to understand my own and other women's worlds and realize that I have to unlearn internalized racism and sexism in order to be able to engage in the kind of dialogue with other women that is requisite to create feminist theory. And that this is a long-term, potentially lifelong project. Second, solidarity is not a given. We need to take responsibility for defining it on our own terms and then working towards it. And to do so, we must confront and eliminate the divisions, fears, prejudices, and resentments between us and develop relationships with one another that affirm the plurality among us. Third, we need to mutually stretch across difference to acknowledge, understand, and define our differences for ourselves, working through conflict in order to learn with and about one another and explore what we can learn from and do with our differences. And finally, we must make the choice to love, to connect, to find ourselves in the other. We cannot weave a pluralistic feminism on our own. So in closing, I'd like to turn to Hooks, who I'm quite glad she's here at the end because I didn't get to speak to her. Uh, she writes, it is the most militant, most radical intervention anyone can make to not only speak of love, but to engage in the practice of love. Anytime we do the work of love, we're doing the work of ending domination. The work of love, is our revolutionary starting point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you to all of our panelists who shared very important work regarding solidarity, around the politics of care. And we don't have any questions, but I think, um, I think one thing that I'd like to kind of bring together is our Lindsay's intervention, but also the first paper that we had from Selena around um, the perception that the public has of nurses. And I just wanted to ask uh, Selena, how can feminists actually build um, solidarity, given that there's such negative no but it's to highlight um, their position in the public health sector is the product of massaging. So that's my question to you. Thank you, Chido. The feminist solutions that I started to talk about, I believe are the way 
for us to be in solidarity with nurses. Why? Because if we do not undo the system of poor health and poor health care for the majority, we will continue to put the burden of general inequality on nurses who carry it when poverty, impoverishment, inequality starts to affect the health of the people. And so maybe I can just put in the chat the link to my paper on achieving sustainable universal healthcare in South Africa. And it goes into some depth on issues that are not dealt with in the NHI, which frankly speaking, everybody supports rather uncritically. And it also talks about some examples elsewhere of how to decommodify healthcare. And it gives the full elaboration of the situation of nurses and community health workers, which which are the majority of the workers dealing with people in the health system. Thank you. Thank you, Salima. Um, Keith asks, um, to what degree poorly behaved nurses might be connected to compassion fatigue? Okay, so peace. I wonder the degree to which poorly behaved. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Compassion fatigue, <laughs> if we, I would say, I, I must tell you that I was the economist for the biggest nurses union in Canada. And though it's a much better funded system, it's fully public. It doesn't have the kind of monopolies that I was showing you for South Africa. Nurses are overloaded. Uh, people take their frustrations out on nurses. And yet, these are the workers that show up 24 hours a day, seven days a week to care for the people. I wanted to show one slide. Uh, oh God, is there time? But I guess to answer your question, if we feel the fatigue, imagine what nurses feel. Now, we can't solve it just by being compassionate though, right? We need to mobilize to make the change, make the love that we just heard in the last pre presentation. Let's make love an actual social reality through changing the healthcare system radically. I know there's not much time, so maybe I'll leave the slide unless somebody wants it. Thank you so much. Um, to the other panelists, um, Polo is us, uh, I shared, I am very interested in the notion of care as women's work, as highlighted in paper one, in conversation with the idea of solidarity as caring for each other. Could the presenter for paper two and three think through the idea of care as kinship. Um, so this would be for Daniela and no, no sorry, this for Daniela and Apana and we would also be having for uh, um I'm gonna jump in it. <laughs> um I think there's, I think with the relationship of a mentor and mentee and how we've constructed it, um, I think care is almost implicit in that, especially when you think about Ubuntu, you really are supporting each other, you're caring because you want um, your mentee, you want your sister to do well. So it goes both ways, this care bi-directionally. Um, yeah, I think it's actually just implicit in the relationship. Um, the key. That's from my point of view. I don't want to talk too long because of the time. Um, Maketo, would you be able to speak as the mentee on um, the aspect of care 
I do appreciate that in your presentation, you highlighted that conventional mentorship, there are issues related to the power imbalance. Um, how has, from your experience as the mentee, how were you able to express your care towards the mirror? I think yes, I am. I think um, it was very important for us to express um, care and love and trust in building our sisterhood. So um, what brought us to the crux of our relationship was us expressing the care, the trust and the love. So it was important in forming and building the sistering mentorship. And how I expressed my care to her um, was through general interest, like genuine interest in her work, her life, <laughs> um, even in her personal life. I remember I'd celebrate her birthday <laughs> um, and so forth. And also care in terms of being uh, a support system in the work that she did within the organization as well. We'd be able to bounce ideas of each other and support each other in whatever tasks and roles. Thank you, Sue, for your intervention. And lastly, Lindsay, um, you can just close off with your um, answer. My thoughts. Thanks, Chido. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> there's definitely an important link um, between between care and kinship, right? And both, um, well, Lord and Hooks and Lugones are all talking about, about this, the idea of care. So for Hooks, we need to be doing what she calls the work of love, right? Um, and one of the aspects of that, of that love ethic is care. Um, I think what's quite an interesting, in terms of thinking about kinship, um, what might be quite interesting is looking at the relationships between kinship and sisterhood and friendship, right? So one of the things that I really take away from Lugones and Spellman's work um, from the 80s and 90s is that they're interested, they compare the kind of the, the feminist ideal of sisterhood with the ideal of friendship. And they think that friendship is actually a better place to start um, with the reconstruction of our relationships with one another because it's not, it, because it's unconditional, Ugh. because it's not unconditional, right? And because it's tied to the particularity of people. So I wonder there whether the whether friendship and that kind of pluralist friendship um, and the relationships between that and the kind of attention that is given in care uh, might be something that we want to pay more attention to. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the intervention, for the conversation and highlighting the importance of care work, but also highlighting that even within feminist communities that you build in solidarity, there will be different. And how do we navigate this difference without, you know, trying to dominate or take over the conversation? So I really want to thank you for bringing these perspectives to life. And with that, we will be closing our panel. I want to say once again, thank you to the panelists Thank you to the organizing team for facilitating this. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and stay tuned for the other sessions. We still have a couple of sessions for the conference. All right, goodbye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.